uh, take it back and wrap up with some more locally focused uh, uh, ordinances and actions that you can take. So with that, um, we are with the Green Infrastructure Center. We're a nonprofit organization. And I wanted to put this little disclaimer at the beginning of our presentation, simply because we have some legislation we'll be talking about. And I just want to note that the work was funded for that study of the legislation by the Virginia Department of Forestry and the US Forest Service. However, um, that does not mean that any of the positions or statements that we state about the legislation is representative of their positions. So just to be clear, anything that we state as position or an opinion in this presentation is solely that of the Green Infrastructure Center, even though our, uh, some of our research was funded by the Virginia Department of Forestry and U.S. Forest Service. So got through that disclaimer quite quickly. And with that, I'll move on to the nuts and bolts. So as I said, uh, the Green Infrastructure Center is a nonprofit organization. We help communities evaluate green assets and manage them to maximize ecology, economy, and culture. And we do this work primarily by building landscape models. So we've built models for the state of Virginia. We've built models for counties and cities. Um, we teach courses and workshops. So today's uh, webinar falls under that category. We also conduct a lot of research into new methods. So a lot of times we'll think of a problem that needs solving and we will get a grant to research how to solve that problem. And then, uh, as Anne said, uh, one of our favorite parts of our job is actually working on the ground with communities to help them create strategies. So uh, as, as Anne noted, uh, Virginia is losing trees. And it, it seems hard to imagine sometimes when you might say drive by an old farm and you see trees growing up in the field or you see land that may be abandoned. But then we also see a lot of development happening. And so when we add up you know, new trees growing and land that's being cleared, it turns out that Virginia is losing about 16,000 acres of trees annually to land conversion, storms, and other causes, even just such as old age. But another way to think about that is that we will develop more land in the next 40 years than we have in the past 400. So since colonialization occurred, you guys, if, depending on your age, will see that in the remainder of your lifetimes. And that's a pretty sobering fact. So the question is, uh, as we grow and develop, in what patterns do we do that? How much of the land do we take up? How much of our forest do we lose? And how much do we plant back? The other key thing to note is that while total acreage of trees is important, it's also important to consider the quality and intactness of our forests. Because forest fragmentation, as you see on the right side of your slide now, is the greatest threat to Southern forests, that breaking up of our forests into smaller and smaller little chunks where they become so small that they cannot meet the functions of providing wildlife habitat and all the other great benefits that forests provide. And urban and suburban canopy, of course, is trending downwards across the nation at about 175,000 acres per year. So um, this is not unique to Virginia, but I like to think that we can be smart in Virginia and tackle this problem head on. Trees provide a lot of benefits and I'm gonna talk about these throughout the presentation today. But just a quick summary of this slide. Of course, we all know about biodiversity and wildlife habitat. I think I'm preaching to the choir on this webinar. Of course, we also wanna conserve working land such as farms and forests that contribute to the economy. Protecting and preserving water quality and supply is another key role that forests play in recharging our aquifers or filtering runoff before it gets to our reservoirs. Providing cost-effective stormwater management and hazard mitigation. You know, those trees can really buffer us against storms and also take care of uh, other issues that we have. And then improving public health, quality of life, and recreation networks. And we like to say that trees are the original green infrastructure. Some of you may have heard of green infrastructure as things like green rooftops or bioswales. But the first definition of green infrastructure was proposed by Florida in 1994. And they really meant to talk about wetlands and marshes and trees and rivers and all of the natural infrastructure that provides services to us. So for example, a typical street tree can take anywhere from 760 gallons to 4,000 gallons of water per tree per year, depending on the species. So that means that tree is helping us manage our stormwater in urban areas. And I just threw this little link down here uh, you will be getting a copy of this webinar recording as well as a copy of the slides. 
Um, but you can actually use a little tool. You can Google I tree, my tree, and you can go outside with a tape measure, calculate the diameter of your tree and tell a little bit about its species and where it's located. And you'll actually get a little report on the health, uh, it's not the health, but excuse me, the um, stormwater uptake, the air quality benefits and other values your tree provides. I did that for a beech tree in my yard and I was just astounded at what a great job my beech tree is doing helping me uh, keep the environment healthy. So trees do create healthy communities and that's a key fact to consider. So of course, uh, access to fitness opportunities. It turns out that we are more likely to walk in areas when we see lots of trees and our, the distances are actually perceived to be shorter when we see a tree lined street than a street without trees. So it actually gets us out and walking. And then clean air, trees absorb pollutants, vault organic compounds, uh, particulate matter, for example. So as we consider about keeping our lungs healthy during this time of COVID, uh, the more trees we have, the cleaner our air will be and the healthier our lungs will be. And then, of course, uh, trees also cool the city and combat respiratory distress like asthma. Well being and mental health it turns out people heal faster when they can see or access green, up to 30% faster. So, a lot of hospitals are starting to add pictures of nature in their waiting rooms. I know our UVA hospital, where we are at, actually made new patient rooms so that they face the mountains and they've put nature pictures all over the hospital. And then a lot of hospitals are also adding green pathways and gardens and places for people to get outside. Also absenteeism of workers is less when you have uh, well-treated environments. Less crime occurs near trees. Um, so I actually put a picture of the police in uh, Bellmead Park. We asked the mounted police to uh, ride through the new park we created to help us. Um, but it turns out that when we create active spaces for people and they're well treated, they have lower crime rates. And then employees will exercise if they could access green where they work and on the way to work. And in fact, we just moved our office to be about a block away from the James River so that we could also get outside and get fit. And then urban tree canopy values, of course, they provide more attractive areas for development or historic districts. Um, and it turns out that people tend to shop longer and pay about 12% more money uh, when the shopping district is tree lined. And so if you spend the money to plant street trees in commercial areas to give them enough soil volume and take care of them, they'll pay you back because you'll get uh, higher property taxes and you'll also get more uh, taxes from restaurants, hotels, lower vacancy rates, et cetera. So trees will pay you back. And then job development. Small companies, especially with those that have a well-paid and skilled workforce, place a strong importance on the green of the local environment. So we have seen cities in the South uh, outcompete much larger communities by showing that they are green, that they have a greenway trail, a tree downtown, great parks. Those things really matter. And especially in our mobile community in the time of COVID, uh, people are starting to go back to rural areas and smaller towns. And the creative class, artists, media, and lawyers make up about 30% of the US workforce. A lot of them can choose where they work and where they live because of our ability to telecommute. Some large companies are actually announcing they're not gonna bring back workers back to work. They're gonna let them work remotely. And so uh, having these green spaces can help your economy be healthy. So trees and parks attract a better paid jobs and thus a better tax base. And then of course, trees add value to your neighborhood and even to your home. So nature sells. The data that you see below is from a study by Kathleen Wolf looking at city trees and property values. And we just turned that into a cute graphic. Um, so if you're planting that tree in your yard, it's going to make your house worth more. Um, if you have an undeveloped lot with trees, that also uh, provides uh, value in terms of real estate taxes. Um, and then, of course, if you're uh, adjacent to woodlands, that also provides value. And then on the right, I provided an example of uh, how trees affect urban heat island. And so the top graph is showing sort of the hot areas. And then the bottom green line is showing how well canopy those areas are. And they're sort of the reverse of each other. And simple way to say that is that um, the greener it is, the less hot it is. And there's a lot of studies showing that cities and towns are gonna to be getting hotter 
as climate change continues to warm the planet. So if you want to combat that, the good news is that you can do so by planting more trees in your community. Areas under trees are about 12 degrees cooler, and so your whole neighborhood is cooler as well. The trees do need certain things, especially in urban areas, to stay healthy. So I just threw out a quick primer on what trees need. They need uh, airflow, circulation. They need light, for, of course, for photosynthesis, creating energy. They need water so they can grow. They need that water to be able to percolate down to those roots. They need nutrients from the soil, and trees even get nutrients from the air. Space, so just room to grow, both for the roots to spread out as well as the canopy, and then to be free from pests and diseases. So watch out for things such as the emerald ash borer or the spotted lantern fly and treat as needed. So if you're interested in learning more about what, how to plant a tree properly or what trees need or getting your soil tested or whatnot, Trees Virginia is a local nonprofit and they have a lot of great information there. They are also working on a list for what you, you should plant in your downtowns. Um, and so in the top right slide you, uh, picture, you see a healthy tree with lots of room to grow. Uh, and then on the bottom, you see what happens when we don't take care of trees. This is a tree that's grown up and its trunk is split. It's actually a hazard right now. They put some safety cones around it, but actually that should probably come down because it's unsafe. So we do need to water trees and prune them in the first couple of life, uh, uh, years of their life to help them get established. So now I'm going to turn it over to Matt Lee. He's going to tell us a little bit about how Virginia state policies affect our ability to manage our trees. Thanks, Karen. So during the course of our research, we uh, examined some of the Virginia state policies and ordinances. Um, and this first one uh, was looking at cluster and conservation development ordinance. So here's a illustration of some forested areas that haven't been uh, developed yet. Um, if you go ahead and tab over, Karen. Here would be an example of a traditional layout where there's large lots. Um, none of the lots are really uh, planned uh, together in terms of layout or design. Whereas with the cluster or conservation development ordinance, um, you can see that the forest is fragmented quite a bit. Um, with the cluster ordinance, the, the lots are, are smaller and they're clustered together along a smaller road footprint um, to kind of minimize the impacts on the landscape. And as you can see in the bottom portion of the parcel, um, there's a natural or open space area that's protected uh, and about 50% of it, which is usually typical for these cluster and conservation development ordinances. And that open space is then accessible for the community that lives in this little subdivision. Uh, there's a little trail network, the wetlands are protected. And so a lot of those functions uh, and services that are provided by those natural assets remain on the site and you get less fragmentation um, of the landscape. So cluster developments maintain a development density, but allow changing lot sizes smaller to preserve some areas as open space. The benefits of them in urban areas, it protects sensitive environmental resources while creating that more compact development pattern, um, which provides efficiencies overall for infrastructure delivery. So there's less um, pipe that needs to be put down in terms of for sewer or water. Uh, the road footprint is much smaller for the development. Um, so it makes overall costs for the developer uh, cheaper because there's less infrastructure that they're, that they're having to put in. Uh, in rural areas, it helps landowners realize some development value, while also kind of conserving those agricultural and forested lands. But some challenges with it is the permitting process can take longer than a typical by right development. And it does not fully protect rural lands from sprawl. So while it is um, a useful, tool. It's not a um, panacea for any situation where you're dealing with uh, sprawl into rural lands. Next slide, please. Other limitations within the state code, it's only for jurisdictions with greater than 10% growth based on the most recent census data. Uh, and so this mostly doesn't apply to anywhere in Virginia. That's an incredibly high growth rate and uh, is not really applicable. 
It also prohibits localities from uh, requiring any kind of site assessment or resource map of the open space to determine any kind of conservation value. Um, so mapping of the floodplain, mapping of steep slopes, uh, identifying any rare or threatened and endangered species on the site, uh, which kind of limits its ability to protect the highest quality conservation areas or uh, open space on the site. It also uh, prohibits special resource areas or open space ex exclusions from density area calculations. And it also prohibits any access pathways from developed areas to open space. So again, allowing those uh, lots that are adjacent to the open space to be able to access it for uh, hiking or bird watching or other um, uh, community values. The open space can also be, sorry, go back for a quick, quick second. The open space can also be disturbed. So you could have any kind of uh, clearing or potentially mitigation like stormwater ponds be built in there. And then um, localities that already have existing regulations before the state ordinance went into effect uh, before 2004 can keep those, but it also prevents them from updating their, their local codes uh, to, to reflect more current growth um, that's going on in their either county or city. The next one we looked at was tree banking. So this allows uh, meeting tree canopy standards offsite when uh, a developer cannot meet onsite requirements. So there's not enough space to be able to plant the trees to meet the canopy standards. But the benefits are it allows for flexibility to plant new trees offsite to meet those uh, standards when um, trying to maintain that tree cover. Some of the challenges though, is that forest or tree cover can be ultimately be disaggregated across the landscape. So you're clearing a site of its forest and you're planting some of it on site, but then other trees are being planted off site in other right of ways or public parks. And while you're adding canopy to the overall landscape, you're not keeping the, that forest cover. So you're getting that fragmentation of tree canopy and forest cover. It could also result in plantings on only public lands or right of ways, and there may not be enough of that uh, public planting space available. So within a locality, about uh, 10 to 20 percent of the space is actually in public lands or in right of way. And so the majority of the land cover is on private property. And so if you're only planting trees on public spaces uh, and losing canopy cover on private property, for example, you're not really uh, distributing that canopy um, equitably or evenly across the landscape. And it may discourage large tree preservation on site. So if you give uh, developers an opportunity to cut down large trees uh, and require them to only plant smaller trees to replace them, you're losing a lot of those benefits that Karen mentioned earlier that large trees provide in terms of stormwater, shade, wildlife habitat, et cetera. It also does not allow any kind of authority to plant outside jurisdictions or consider the landscape scale. So if you're thinking about uh, the watershed scale, for example. Next slide. Within the tree banking code uh, limitations, developers can claim hardships to avoid tree replacement. And that's kind of an ambiguous or vague statement within the code. Um, the particular code that tree banking is under 15.2-961, tree planting funds are restricted to only the local government. So if there's a NGO or a local nonprofit that is doing tree planting, um, they're not allowed to access those funds to be able to plant trees on private property, for example. And with the other code, 15.2-961.1, it only applies to planning district eight and those tree canopy fund expenditures are limited to the same non-attainment area in which they were generated. So again, it does not allow those funds to be distributed across jurisdictions. The tree conservation ordinance or also known as the heritage trees, it allows trees to be classified as heritage specimen memorial to require special permitting for their removal or a financial penalty. The benefits uh, is that it does try to get at a way it is uh, protecting those mature trees, which provide those greater ecosystem services. The challenges and limitations though, is it can limit site development and the calculations for payment required for financial loss is vague. So there's a section B within the clause um, that is concerning the taking of private property and the compensation for public use. 
which can discourage localities from implementing this ordinance. So for example, a private landowner could claim they were going to build a large hotel on their property, but a designated tree, like a heritage tree, was preventing it and file a lawsuit or claim against the locality for the taking of private property. Um, the removal fine cap is, uh, or the removal fine is capped at $2,500 per violation. So in some localities where land is incredibly expensive and there's a uh, very high pressure to develop, uh, $2,500 is not really discouraging for um, a developer to remove that tree. Trees is nutrient credit. So in 2005, uh, originally, developed a, a nutrient credit trading program, which was originally point source pollution trading. In 2009, it was updated to allow trading between agricultural and non-point sources and point sources. It um, focuses on changing from forested to non-forested land covers, and it requires mitigation. Um, the credits are based on the Chesapeake Bay models, non-point source calculations. And trading areas are within an eight digit huck or hydrological unit uh, watershed or adjacent watershed. The benefits are a variety of management, nutrient management practices can be used um, and reforestation or reforested lands are permanently protected. The challenges and limitations though are only ag lands are eligible for credits. So urban lands are not eligible for credit trading. And this limits incentive to preserving existing forest land cover. Uh, reforestation criteria are minimal and no way, there's no way to verify no net loss of forest cover. Next slide. The tree replacement ordinance, so this is at 15-2-961. Uh, uh, the background sets maximum tree canopy coverage by zoning to replace trees lost during development. Some localities offer bonus credits for leaving mature trees on site to achieve tree canopy tree canopy cover percentages. The benefits are that it prevents mature uh, canopy loss or maintains canopy cover uh, at its current levels, so that no net loss, and requires developers mitigate losses to the urban tree canopy. So again, it gets back to that tree banking that I discussed earlier. The challenges though, is it prevents setting more expansive canopy standards. So there's maximum can canopy percentages that a locality can adopt. And so it doesn't allow for anything greater than those, uh, those max uh, canopy requirements. And a site's mature trees can be sacrificed as long as new tree plantings meet the required canopy. The limitations is that only planted district A can enact higher canopy standards. However, there are some new, new proposals to uh, removing this limitation um, being proposed by some of the state legislature and the General Assembly. Localities restricted to a 20 year timeline for developers uh, to achieve co uh, cover requirements. Um, although there is a new proposal to require canopy achievement uh, in a 10 year window instead of a 20 year window. It'll be interesting to see um, how that plays out on the urban landscape. Um, do, you know, do you end up crowding trees in smaller spaces uh, to achieve short term canopy goals? Uh, does it push more trees off site into a tree canopy bank? And then where do those trees end up going? Um, but it'd be an interesting case study to see if that legislation ends up getting passed. Um, and then it's also limited within the Chesapeake Bay jurisdictions or population areas greater than 75 people per square mile. Trees as best management practices are uh, BMPs. So this gets at the stormwater component. So individual trees are not currently considered a best management practice for storm managing stormwater. Uh, DEQ will report on new options in November. I just checked the DEQ's uh, public calendar and haven't seen any kind of release of a report um, in November uh, and didn't see any kind of dates. So I'm not really sure what the current status is of that advisory committee. The DEQ is currently investigating that with the stakeholder group and we'll be releasing hopefully its report uh, soon. The benefits are that trees reduce the amount of stormwater runoff by capturing precipitation and infiltrating it on site or through evapotranspiration and thus reducing flooding and recharge of groundwater. So a lot of the examples that Karen mentioned earlier in the presentation. Some of the challenges though are quantifying that standard volume for credit is difficult. Um, and that's because there's a lot of variables to consider. So tree size, tree species, the location and soils where the tree is planted, amongst other variables. 
There's also a lag time for compliance if new and young trees are planted. So those young trees are not going to provide those same benefits as that 20, 30 year old uh, mature canopy that is uh, was lost on site. And then also what happens to compliance if a tree dies in say year 10, um, do you have to go back and plant a new tree? And that tree is still not going to achieve, you know, those benefits because of that lag time. And some of the limitations for trees as BMPs, only existing forest cover can be counted as a stormwater management under um, Virginia's program. Next slide, please. So here's just an example of trees can be used in concert with existing BMPs such as bioswale. So here's a tree planted in a bioswale and it's providing additional benefits because you have the multi-layered um, canopy and the tree roots are providing infiltrating into the soil deeper and getting that, that water uh, further into the ground. Next slide. And some of the biggest questions is, do other places use trees as BMPs? And the answer is yes. So Karen mentioned that Center for Water Protection has a tool to calculate the volume benefits per tree. And you can follow that link later uh, to see the use of that. And then some local or some other examples um, in other places throughout the country, Pine Lake, Georgia, uses 10 gallons of water per credit per inch of the diameter of breast height. And so that's a measurement at four and a half feet above the ground to uh, measure the diameter of a tree. So for preserving trees existing under 12 inches and 20 gallons of credit per inch for trees over 12 inches. Washington, D.C., also uses a volumetric approach of 20 cubic feet for each preserved tree and 10 cubic feet for each planted tree. And trees planted are a part of a BMP, in other words, the bioswale for 10 cubic feet per water. And then uh, finally, Portland uh, uses a tree credit, which can be used to offset 10% of a site's impervious surface area. So this is an uh, area measurement credit um, and they use that as a BMP. Next slide. So we're gonna switch gears and see some other examples locally within Virginia that Karen's gonna talk about on how these policies and practices can make trees healthier uh, in the future and now. Thanks, Matt. And um, just for your interest, this is a picture of um, veterans uh, planting uh, trees at the McGuire Veterans Hospital, which was one of our projects. So I wanted to switch gears now, take us down to the local level, because there are some problems with how our state legislature has treated trees in the past. Um, hopefully some of those will be rectified in the coming years. Um, but in the meantime, there are things that are going on just locally and how we take care of our trees that we want to focus on. Um, so I'm going to start out really quickly with just talking about urban tree canopy and water. Uh, because the trees intercept uh, more than 20% of annual rainfall is retained in the crown of our trees. And a uh, you know, healthy urban forest can delay runoff up to 3.7 hours. As Matt mentioned, those roots actually help increase the infiltration capacity of the soils by breaking the soil up. And then as I mentioned earlier, a tree can soak up many thousands of gallons of water per tree per year. So the more trees we have in our cities and towns, the less uh, problems we'll have with stormwater runoff. And the same is true for our rural areas. Now, the more we can uh, replace some of maybe those abandoned farm fields with forests and regrow our forests, uh, the healthier our watersheds will be in our water quality. So as land cover changes, so does that infiltration. And I'm sure you guys have seen variations of this image before. Um, and I don't want to dwell on this a long time, just to say that uh, obviously in a in a rural or undeveloped watershed, you get a lot more water hitting the groundwater table and more uh, water being absorbed by the vegetation. And then as you go all the way down along this continuum, you get to a super developed situation, a lot less water hitting the groundwater table and your groundwater table starts to compress. And that is why we have, uh, one of the reasons why we have a problem with land subsidence on our coast of Virginia, because we are actually over withdrawing our groundwater and then starving our groundwater of that water resource. The trees can really help with that. So we can plant trees back in cities. There's lots of places to fit trees. Um, and of course we have lots of parking lots all over that could be retrofitted. We could actually redesign those parking lots and add trees back in so that we get less flooding and standing water. So one factoid is uh, an acre of pavement releases 36 times more runoff than a forest. 
Or another way of thinking about that is if it rains one inch, an acre of forest will release about 750 gallons of runoff, while a parking lot will release 27,000 gallons. You can see what a difference it makes when we change that land cover to pave. Also keep in mind a lot of our cities in Virginia, much of that, many of their acreage, much of the acreage was developed before stormwater management requirements. So a lot of our cities don't have uh, management for our stormwater runoff. So one key thing is to think about how we can link a city's trees to its stormwater infrastructure. Start thinking of our trees, like we said at the beginning, as green infrastructure. Um, and so if you do establish your city's uh, trees as that role and document it, you can actually get money from FEMA to replace trees if you lose them during storms. And if you have a stormwater utility fee in your community, that means you pay a little fee for how much runoff you have from your lot. Um, some communities let you get a credit if you plant trees um, to make up for that runoff. And like we said, one tree can soak up many thousands of gallons of water. So we decided we wanted to do a study to show uh, how effective trees really are in soaking up stormwater. So we wrote a grant proposal um, with six states to the US Forest Service to do this demonstration. We did this all across the South and you can see the states that are on the right. And we picked uh, pilot cities in each state and we wanted to pick communities uh, of different sizes and shapes and different environments, so like on the coast and the Piedmont and the mountains. So Virginia's uh, study cities were Norfolk, Harrisonburg, and Lynchburg. And the purpose was to really explain, to really model that role of trees in soaking up stormwater. Because urban forests are a vital tool, but oftentimes we only focus on digging stormwater ponds uh, when we've got this beautiful solution right in front of us. So. We were very fortunate because the Chesapeake Bay folks had already uh, created a panel, an expert panel to look at BMP effectiveness for urban tree canopy expansion. And if you're really excited, you can Google this document and get a copy of it. But what I wanted, I didn't want to go into a lot of math today, but just to say that when engineers are deciding how much stormwater they need to treat from a site, they use the, the, the runoff equation. That's what this R stands for, runoff. And Heineken and divers uh, several years ago sort of took a look at this runoff equation and said, you know, it's just imagines that rain is falling and hitting the ground and there's nothing happening in between that. Nothing's intercepting that rain. But as you all know, if you're standing outside and you see a tree, you know that that tree is intercepting some of those raindrops and that tree is actually capturing some of that water, holding it and evaporating it. And so they added this term, um, CI to, to this equation. So that's what's different is now accounts for the role that trees play in capturing and holding some of that water. So what we did was we mapped the study communities at one meter by one meter resolution. That means very fine level of detail. We could tell what's going on in every meter of land cover. We use satellite imagery to do that. And then we classify the image to determine what is tree, what is open space, what is impervious space. So this is the city of Norfolk and those purple lines are the watersheds. And that means by knowing what's happening on every square meter, we know that when that raindrop falls, that those drops that fall through the canopy, will they hit a parking lot or the lawn? Or are those trees in a natural forest and that water's more likely to be absorbed? Or is, it gonna, is that drop gonna fall on the street? In which case it's probably gonna run off and not be captured by the tree's roots. So uh, we looked at the soils and the tree canopy and the different um, surfaces underneath every tree uh, to then determine how much water those trees were soaking up. We created a little calculator tool, which I don't have a lot of time to go into today, but there's an examples of this on our website. And uh, we can then figure out by what kind of storm. So over here, it says pick an event, one year, 24 hour storm. Just so you guys know, engineers model this by um, looking at how much, what type of storm it is. And when they're doing uh, designs for stormwater management, it's usually by the, what's called the 10 year storm. Um, but I just picked a small rainfall event and then you can see how much um, the current tree canopy is, the impervious cover. We can look at how much water is being captured in millions of gallons. We can look at how much more runoff we would have if we lost trees. We can look at how much more water we could capture if we planted trees. And so we can play around with this. This is a modeling tool using the real data from the communities. 
and it helps engineers and planners and foresters figure out uh, what will be the benefits of planting those trees. It also calculates the pollution load captured by the trees. So it calculates the nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment uptake by the current trees. And then it looks at if you change different things, like if you become more impervious, or if you plant more trees, how much uh, would you increase or decrease that pollution loading? And so not everyone likes a spreadsheet, so we also turned it into a map. Um, so that for each community, they can see the best places to plant trees. So it's hard, a little hard to see at this scale, but some of these maps have orange colors. So green is uh, where we have um, existing canopy, but in the places that have orange, that means that if we plant trees there, they'll soak up the most water. And that's based on the soils. And then we can look at the best places to retain canopy. Again, not everyone likes a spreadsheet. So we said, if you're going to develop these are the places that darker the green, the more important those trees are for soaking up stormwater runoff. And so what can you do? Well, it's hard to really turn everyone into an expert in, in legislation and regulations, and that's not my intent today, but we did create a little spreadsheet. So if you don't mind using spreadsheets, it has a list of all of the ordinances you should have in place to either reduce impervious surface, so reduce that land cover that causes lots of runoff, and the things that you can do to improve, expand, or enhance uh, what you have. And so it just looks like this, and it already has all the information in there. It tells you what to look for. And you simply uh, click through and see if, indeed, does your, organ does your community have that ordinance in place? or does it have that requirement in place? And to let you guys know how I was able to do this for quite a few towns, I assigned my graduate students to, as homework, to pick a city and then go ahead and, and, have, to, um, and have to actually take care of it. Okay, so, um, sorry, my phone was blinking at me and causing me to be distracted. Um, so, one of the things you can do, these are some examples of the kinds of things we look for, is uh, reduce excessive parking space requirements and increase parking lot perviousness. So in this example, you know, we often design shopping malls for uh, Christmas day. And so um, as a result, we have overbuilt our parking. So it's really important to um, try to look at whether we're over requiring the parking. And then other things you can do is add bioswales to parking lots to capture some of that runoff or even permeable pavers. And I purposefully put in a picture from a Walmart because um, everyone thinks, so that's just something weird that you would do. But even Walmart, um, and you know, they're as conservative as they come, um, has gone ahead and, and put in some permeable parking spaces. So lots of things that can be done from changing standards to retrofitting existing spaces to redesigning the surface and how we treat those parking lots. And then of course, accommodating large trees is really important. So avoid this, I say, is it this tree's fault that the sidewalk is popped up? No, it's not the tree's fault. Whoever planted too large a tree in too small a space. And there are other things you can do too to reinforce structures underground. This is an example of a Silva cells, which are like little sort of crate-like structures filled with soil that sort of guide the roots to where we want them to go and give them room to spread out without popping up that sidewalk. And so we can actually fit large trees in the downtown areas, but we need to provide room to grow. And there are also lots of different kinds of suspended pavement systems. I mentioned Silva cells because I'm familiar with them, but there are other choices as well. And then saving trees, so working with developers to shrink the development footprint. And I'm a planning commissioner in my, in my spare time for fun, just kidding, but I really am a planning commissioner. And I listen to a lot of presentations and look at a lot of site plans. And by the time a site plan comes to a planning commission or to your town or city council, it's very difficult to make changes because they've already spent a lot of money with that particular design. Um, they've already gotten, you know, look, looking for bank loans and other things. So they spent a lot of money and time. And so it's better to have that conversation at an earlier stage. So some communities encourage developers to come in and have a sit down chat so that we can have this conversation about what areas we might like to preserve for trees. And then as uh, Matt spoke about earlier, there are changes to our state code 
um, that could make it uh, less um, easy to clear a whole site uh, before you have a, a solid development plan in place. And then we recommend everyone map their tree canopy and understand their both their canopy as well as their impervious surfaces. Um, if you would like us to help you, you can certainly contact us. Um, but there are lots of different firms and different methods that you can use to map tree loss. And so we're not suggesting anyone on this call necessarily is going to run out and do this, but uh, you might encourage your community. So find out, do you have a tree canopy map? Do you have a tree canopy goal? Uh, what is your community doing to implement that? And then looking at developing an actual urban forest management plan so that you actually have a goal established for how much canopy you want to have into the future. And then you can link those goals to other plans such as your uh, park open space plans, recreation plans, um, public works plans, all of those different things can be tied together. And there are grants available for creating um, urban forest management plans. Uh, and then an emergency response plan, something we often don't think about, but as we're seeing that we're starting to get maybe more severe storms and some say even more frequently. Um, when our trees come down in storms, we need to have a plan for what to do with them, but we can also uh, create a plan for how to prepare. So we can actually deal with a lot of those risky trees ahead of time. So if you're interested in this, um, this community forest storm mitigation plan, you know, there's one for Virginia on the Virginia Department of Forestry's website. And then we've recently updated that guide and that's available on our website as well. So this is a free tool um, to help you understand some of the things you might look at in your community. And then of course, the most obvious thing is to plant trees in your own yards if you do have a yard with room for trees. But let's say you're a real tree activist and you've already planted trees everywhere you can fit. Well, maybe you could volunteer at a local elementary school to help them plant trees. So the key, takeaway here is that individual actions make a big difference. And we actually did this little uh, set, little mini study for Norfolk where we looked at the fact that they had 47,500 parcels, 31,000 had room for at least one tree. So if everyone planted a single tree, they would intercept 62 million gallons of rainwater every year or one and a half million bathtubs. So think about organizing tree plantings in your community, uh, you know, at city parks, along streets, everywhere. And then planting forested buffers. So I think a few folks have pointed out in the chat that yes, uh, the Chesapeake Bay uh, Preservation Act does require us, you know, to have 100 foot buffers. However, keep in mind that a lot of Virginia was lacking in buffers before that act was passed. And it doesn't actually apply to the entire Chesapeake Bay drainage, right? So the Chesapeake Bay drainage takes up two thirds of Virginia, uh, but these buffers are not required everywhere. So, um, Think about working to plant those back. And um, if you're interested in some of the Chesapeake Bay best management practices for trees to meet the state's watershed implementation plans, that's a mouthful. Um, I put a little link there where you can uh, get a look, take a look at all the different best management practices for trees. And then if you do play around with the spreadsheet, like I was talking about, it actually gives you a little scorecard at the end to tell you how you're doing. Um, and I took off the name for what city this was for because I don't want to, you know, tell on anyone. It's really a tool to just say, here's where you're doing well. Like in this place here, this community did a perfect score of 100% on some elements, but then on some other areas around tree care and protection, they fell short. So it's a little self-scoring tool that you can use. And like I said, I use my graduate students to get them to fill it out. So you might work with the local university um, and have them try this tool out. Uh, so a lot of products you can use if you're interested in this work. Um, the audit tool I just showed you, that's available on our website. If you'd like to learn more about our calculator tool, that also is on our website. There's case studies for all of the cities we studied. So you can get those three Virginia ones, or you can look at the study of all 12 communities that we published as well. And we continue to follow up on implementation. I was just uh, doing a webinar with the City of Norfolk yesterday, and they're doing a lot of great tree planting. Uh, and then we have numerous books and guides. So um, if you're like, I would say like maybe just a regular person, I would get the Virginia guide, just available for shipping, or you can come by our office and get a free one. Uh, if you wanna buy our national book that is designed for planners uh, or community members. And then if you're a GIS whiz and you really like to, build models, we've actually got one for you too. So all of these tools are available on our website, but a lot of the things I talked about today are free um, and available for download. 
So our newest project is Resilient Coastal Forests, where we're actually looking at the health of the forest in a large region of Virginia, shown here on the from the right hand side, straddling two sides of the York watershed and we're looking at all the different impacts that might be coming to our forests in the future such as fire pests storm surges zoning development pressures and then working on locally based plans so how we can stave off or mitigate some of those threats so that will be published um, probably in another year or so we're a little bit slowed down by covid with our local engagement so with that we got to the end and we do still have some time for questions I'm going to turn it back to Anne, who's been, I think, probably diligently monitoring the chat room. Thanks so much, Karen. And you um, had, yes, you had one last slide, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Um, you can pull that up, but while that's up, let me just go through some of the questions. So Judy asked, what is the statute that addresses tree canopy percentages? Let me just say, Judy, that is in the VCN briefing paper that I'm going to send out to everybody who, um, who signed up for the webinar. So there was also a question about the link to the spreadsheet um, that Karen just mentioned that's on the Green Infrastructure Center website, but I'll be sure to include that specific link in um, along with the recording of this webinar and Karen's slides. So I know she covered a whole lot of information. We'll be able to get all of that um, to you. So let's see. So Robert Jordan asked a question about what what about using structural soils for tree planting and um, for redevelopment of highly urbanized areas? So for example, the redevelopment of downtown McLean um, is a way to give trees additional soil volume. Yeah, sure. You can use cer certainly structural soils are one tool that you can use. Um, there's been a bunch of studies in terms of how well they work. If you're interested, I can try to get that link to set for Anne to send out. Um, we didn't really have time to cover that, but it's true that a lot of times when you're on a site that's um, been developed or is being prepared for development, they often scrape off the first few feet of topsoil, first foot or two. And so you have really poor compacted soils that you're left with. So amending the soils is really important. Even if you're living in a subdivision, you might have already lost a lot of your organic horizon. So soil amendments are also important. Um, so Brian Kane asked, how do jurisdictions monitor or follow up with off-site tree planting? So if you weren't able to achieve those canopy percentages on the parcel, especially in years after installation, how do we know that those trees grow to maturity and ultimately assist in sequestration? Are there publicly funded monitoring programs? Okay, that's a complicated question. I'm gonna answer that in two parts. Part one is, um, we recommend people create a, a redo their canopy map every four to five years so that they can actually track how they're doing. So first of all, what they have, what is their goal and how are they doing? In terms of say a developer that might be required to put in some canopy, uh, you can bond that canopy. In other words, we already bond the stormwater pond and the other facilities that a developer, if they said they were building sidewalks, we, we have a bond on that development. We don't release that bond until we ensure that all of those things are in place. The longest bond that I've ever seen for say tree canopy is two years. Um, so it is possible, you know, like if you're selling a development lot and you required a tree be planted in every front yard or maybe the developer proffered that, that, that homeowner can certainly cut that tree down the day they move in. There's nothing making them keep those trees in place. Um, so it, it kind of depends on uh, what was the purpose of the trees? Um, you know, was it part of some legal agreement? Like if they said they were going to have open space and it was going to be treed in perpetuity and have to keep the trees in place. So it's, it's a pretty complicated question, um, but certainly um, creating a map and tracking it over time really helps. I can say that um, in some of the site plans that I've received, say from developers where they want to like expand their site or expand a use and they have to turn in um, another special use permit. One of the things we do is we go and look at whether they're still in compliance with their original site plan. And there have been cases where we say, hey, where, where's all that vegetation you were supposed to have in place? It seemed to be missing. And so we made them put it back. <laughs> so mm. lots of different ways to handle that problem. Um, I love Mary Glass's question because she's thinking about coalitions and collaboration. She says, are you working with the Virginia APA chapter to get these insights to a broad range of urban planners in Virginia who don't recognize the importance of trees and multiple master plan components? 
Sure. So I've done um, many workshops in Virginia for planners, and we have done them for continuing education credits, which is a, a great way to get planners to show up. I've also spoken at Virginia's APA conference numerous times. And um, I'll tell you a really funny thing is um, when you offer continuing credits, a lot of planners will show up and say, I thought this was going to be really boring, but actually I learned something and I'm going to use it. Um, the planners are also brutally honest, but uh, yeah, those continuing ed credits really help, help and we're hoping to offer some of those online coming up this year, this next year, sorry, this year's ending. <laughs> so Karen, I have a question based on your slides and then I'll get back to the, um, the other, the rest of, we've got a few more in the queue. But one of the things you mentioned was the pre-development meeting Mm -hmm. um, and how helpful it is to before the site plan is completely submitted and um, and tied up with a bow, that's a good time to sort of look at it and say, well, wait a minute, maybe you could reconfigure the driveway, the back porch, whatever, to take advantage of particularly some of the mature trees on the lot. Mm -hmm. How how do individuals find out? Um, sort of when those site plans are submitted. What is, I mean, if you can't all be on the planning commission, what, what, do, you what do you suggest as a way to stay involved? Well, um, this may be something that you need to encourage your local governments to do, but some local governments are really good about having a, a web portal showing all of their upcoming development permits. Um, some cities actually notify their neighborhood associations when they have developments in their area, even if they're what's called by right, just letting them know that this is coming up. And um, you can get on, I know for most cities I've worked with, they have a, a mailing list you can, or a you know, email list you can get on to let you know when there's site plans that are happening in your area. So all of those site planning meetings are open to the public. Um, I will say that one of the things I find annoying is that they're usually held on things like uh, days like, uh, you know, Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. when a lot of people are at work. Um, so I wish they were, would be held in the evening more often. And then for any sites that need a special use permit, let's say they're asking for a special permission or they're trying to change the zoning, those will all require public hearings. Um, but again, I would get in touch with your local planner and ask if they have an email list or a, a place on their website where you can uh, make yourself aware of development projects that are coming to your area. Excellent. Uh, so Wolf Josie asks, are there any Virginia examples of publicly funded tree planting projects on private property? Yeah, I mean, we could, we could take an example right from Richmond. Um, what we did was uh, we, we formed a coalition of folks and we got grants and then the city helped to fund as well as the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation funded planting uh, in people's yards. So um, the idea is that we did plant trees in the parks and we planted trees at the Veterans Hospital, but we also had a program to plant trees in yards. And then um, we hired a local neighborhood person to help be the coordinator. And so I think that's really important. But uh, yes, there are examples of that. I think um, some cities um, can give money to nonprofits and then the nonprofit does the planting. Because we sometimes hear that people are worried about liability, like if a city employee planted a tree in your yard, but that's usually taken care of by giving a grant to a nonprofit to do the tree planting. And then also tree giveaways. Uh, a lot of communities hold tree giveaways. And um, Norfolk in, in particular has been having fun with, uh, they took a lesson from Texas in a program called Jam and Jams. So it, it really goes after people who like jam and pie, right? Like mm -hmm. that's, a, that's probably most of us. And so um, you don't have to love a tree, but if you like pie, they have these workshops where you can come and get a fruit tree and then they teach you how to make jam or pie out of it. Um, so they found a new way to people's hearts um, through, through pie to get to trees. So planting community orchards, giving away those trees um, for people to take home and plant in their yard. Uh, it's really in interesting. And we're actually writing a guide on how to launch a successful tree planting campaign and how to engage the community in, in doing a lot of that work. So um, that will probably be coming out uh, about middle of next year. All right, uh, it looks like we've got about three minutes. So let me cover this slide, this last slide really quickly. Um, I always get questions after these webinars that, that say, tell me some specific steps that I can take. 
Um, the first one is tell a friend, save a forest, right? If you share this webinar with just one other person, you have doubled its impact. If you share it with a civic association, a homeowners association, the garden club, um, your master naturalist chapter, your master gardeners chapter, then you have quadruple, quintupled the effect and the impact of this webinar because Kieran and Matt shared a tremendous amount of information. This is all really helpful. The second thing you can do is to be knowledgeable about what your locality's um, ordinances already say, because if you were to go to the General Assembly, for instance, from a locality that does not currently have a tree conservation ordinance and testify in subcommittee, then somebody could very quickly get up and say, but wait a minute, um, XYZ locality does not currently have a tree conservation ordinance on their books. So why do they need um, state legislation in order to fix a problem that they don't have? Um, so the first thing is just go to your local government, your municipal website, just type in the search bar tree pre preservation or tree conservation, and it'll take you straight to those ordinances. The next bullet says ask your legislators to support the changes outlined today. So um, along with Karen's webinar and her slides, I'll also include the VCM briefing paper that we wrote and it has the links in it to the exact two pieces of state code that we are, that we are trying to get changed. So you'll know exactly what that is. We don't have a patron yet. We don't have a bill number, but we will. And as soon as we do, then I will forward that, at, we'll forward that to everybody who sat in on this webinar. And then the last thing Karen and Matt both um, stressed is it, it starts locally, right? One single um, change. If you see that, that um, you know, Tree Fredericksburg, for instance, had a tree giveaway, my next door neighbor's got a, a an entire backyard that had doesn't have a single tree in it. I was like, you know what, would you be interested in this? And sure enough, she went and she picked up five trees. We planted them together. You know, you can be the change you want to see in your community. So I, I really encourage you to get involved. If there's not already a tree stewards group in your locality, start one, right? Um, Trees Virginia would love, and the Department of Forestry would love to set up and help train, you know, a group of people. They want to start with a minimum of a dozen to make it worth, worth their time. But, you know, it's absolutely something that you could get started. So I think I've got, ooh, less than, less than 30 seconds. Let me just say, um, there were a couple other questions, but I've got, I, I wrote those down so Karen, you and I can, um, can shoot those folks an email so I can answer those in the follow-up email that I send to everybody thanking you for, for being here and for, um, and for listening today. So uh, Karen and Matt, any last words? Just wanted to say we really appreciate your time today. All right, I think we've probably said more than everyone wanted to hear. <laughs> um, feel free to email us. Um, I'll put our email back up real quick. Um, we are happy to answer emails offline. There's probably other questions that folks had that we just didn't get, have time to get to. So shoot us an email and we'll try to send you an answer if we know it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining today and be on the lookout for an email from me. It'll be all the information I just said that we would, would, would share with you. So thank you and have a great afternoon and happy Turkey Day. Thanks so much. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. So... I did. Um...